Kyle Lutz. I'm a software engineer at Google, and today I'm going to be talking about a side project I've been working on for the past couple of years called Boost Compute. It's a GPU library for, or a C++ library for GPU computing. Um, so the aim, I guess, of the mission statement is to be an implementation of the STL for parallel devices. And parallel devices uh, are a wide range of uh, devices including GPUs like those from NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, and multi-core CPUs like many of us have in our computers these days, and includes even more exotic uh, accelerators like the Intel Xeon Phi or the Adaptiva Epiphany, and even includes FPGAs like those from Altera or Xilinx. So why parallel? Um, as we've all been hearing for the past numerous years, the free lunch is over, this scaling of um, Processor speed, the speed of our code, doesn't really continue. Single-threaded execution performance really represents a tiny fraction of the total computational power of a modern desktop or workstation. Um, these days, NVIDIA produces GPUs with multiple teraflops of performance where writing or using this uh, C++ STL doesn't give you access to it all. So why the STL? So I wanted to write a library that would be familiar to those already familiar with C++ and the SEL. And it simplifies porting existing C++ applications to use these new parallel architectures. Uh, so the basic design looks like this. At the bottom there's the hardware parallel device, whether that's a GPU or multi-core CPU or an FPGA. On top of that, Boost Compute uses OpenCL in order to talk to the hardware. OpenCL is a cross-platform vendor-neutral standard um, released by the Kronos Group, which uh, provides a unified interface to talking to these parallel accelerators. On top of that, Boost Compute implements a, a small core like wrapper API around the OpenCL C API. Uh, this provides a more idiomatic C++ programming interface. Um, it includes classes for OpenCL objects and uses more traditional like RIAA functionality and more or in, implements error checking um, more in a C++ type fashion. On top of the core API, Boost Compute implements uh, STL-like API as well as a number of other uh, components including fancy iterators um, somewhat similar to those provided by the Boost Iterator Library. Also includes support for random number generators and a lambda expression framework. Again, all of this targeted at uh, parallel devices. So the most common question I get asked when talking about Boost Compute is, why did I choose OpenTL? Or usually more along the lines of, why not CUDA or Thrust or Bold or C++ AMP or OpenACC or any of these other newer technologies for um, executing code on parallel devices? And when I started Boost Compute, I had a few goals or a few aims, things I wanted to accomplish. I wanted to write a library that's standard C++, something that works on any standards conforming C++ compiler, something that didn't require some special proprietary compiler or special proprietary compiler extensions. Um, I also wanted to implement a library-based solution, something that you can include and link to like any other C++ library, something that didn't require some sort of special pre-processing step or build system integration. It should work just like any other C++ library. And I also wanted to target a vendor-neutral open standard. Um, this allows Boost Compute to operate on a wide number of um, parallel devices. OpenCL implementation are implementations are available from dozens of uh, hardware vendors and software vendors and basing it on OpenCL allows Boost Compute to work on any of these. So the low-level API, um, like I said, it provides a C++ API over the C API provided by OpenCL. It includes classes for managing uh, OpenCL objects like buffers and contexts and command queues. It takes care of the manual reference counting required and takes care of error checking and also provides some utility functions to make it a little simpler to get up and running on a GPU device. So in code, the low level API kind of looks like this. At the top, we include the core, the boost compute core.hpp header, which brings into scope all of these um, core wrapper classes. Uh, this first line of code here uh, uses the boost compute 
default device function to essentially look up what we consider the default device on the system. This uses a number of heuristics, such as choosing a GPU, usually over a multi-core CPU, or, and can also be influenced by a number of environmental variables, so end users can select what device uh, they want to target. Yep. Where does it find its list to choose from? Or? Um, so OpenCL provides ways to enumerate the OpenCL implementations available on a system, and each implementation has one or more devices that you can choose from. So it basically looks over that list and chooses what the best one we think is. So once we have the GPU device, we create an OpenCL context. Um, OpenCL context is basically the OpenCL state, and it's a place where you can allocate, say, memory buffers on a device or compile OpenCL program objects for execution on a device. Uh, the next line of code here creates a command queue. Command queues are OpenCL's way of specifying work to be done on a device or ways to initiate transfers of memory between the host and the device. And this last line of code here simply prints out the the name of the GPU. This, these top three lines of code are the pretty usual boilerplate that exists in any application that wants to execute code on a GPU device. Um, so just as an example, mm, Boost Compute allows you to, uh, to enumerate all the devices available from all the platforms on a system. So this small line of code basically loops through all of them, prints out their name, to write the equivalent function in just based on the raw OpenCL API would be something like you know, 60 lines of code, which includes calling half a dozen different OpenCL functions, um, manually allocating and deallocating memory, manually checking for errors. Oh, I'm just looking at your deletes throughout the <laughs> <laughs> They bother me too. <laughs> Yeah. So, it, I mean, it provides a natural, more idiomatic C++ API to handle, you know, or to not force programmers to deal at this level of the API and really just concentrate on executing their application on some sort of parallel device. So, on top of this low-level interface, or this low-level wrapper API, Boost Compute implements a number of high level, higher level APIs. Um, the most prominent one is the STL-like API, which essentially mimics the interface provided by the C++ STL. Um, we implement a large number of algorithms. Um, I think about 90% of the algorithms in standard, the standard STL are implemented now in Boost Compute. Um, we also implement a number of like parallel extension algorithms or algorithms more targeted for par parallel computing, and those are highlighted in orange here. They're things like uh, inclusive and exclusive scans, um, scatter gather, reduce, sort by key, those kind of operations. And do those correspond to the similar definitions we have in the parallel parallelism TS for C++? A lot of them have a very similar interface. Some of the extensions, like I think reduce has a slightly different signature, but it really accomplishes the same thing. Oh, uh, the question was, do these extension, do these algorithms match those found in the C++ 17 parallelism, parallelism uh, technical specification? Um, yeah, in addition to algorithms, Boost Compute also provides a number of um, standard library-like containers, uh, the most prominent being like a regular vector, which allocates a contiguous buffer on a GPU device, and others based on that, arrays, bit sets, um, even some associative containers like uh, maps and sets. Um, there's also a large number of iterators implemented. Um, the core is this top one buffer iterator, which works very similarly to how pointers work on the device. It indicates a particular memory buffer and an index within that memory buffer, and allows you to um, specify ranges of data to algorithms to be operated on. In addition, it also implements these so-called fancy iterators, similar to those provided by the boost iterator library. Um, these work on top of the low-level iterators, like buffer iterator, and um, can kind of augment their functionality. Uh, also, we implement a number of random number generators and statistical distributions. Again, all of these work very similarly to how those work in the C++11 SCL, but they all execute and run on uh, GPUs or other parallel hardware. Um, so, code example. So, typical C++ is how you allocate and sort a vector of integers. Um, we include the vector header, the algorithm header to bring in our vector class and sort algorithm. 
Uh, at the top here, we declare a vector of integers, fill it with some data, and then invoke the std sort algorithm on that range of data in order to sort them. So adapting it to boost compute looks is fairly trivial. Um, include, instead of including the algorithm header, we now include the boost compute algorithm sort header, which brings in the boost compute sort function. Um, we still keep the data on the device, same declaration as before, but now instead of calling std sort, we call it boost compute sort. Um, and we pass it this one extra argument, which is the queue, which, uh, like I said before, indicates what device to actually execute the, the sorting operation on. So what this does is it takes this range of data, which is still resident on the host, copies it to the device, creates a sort kernel, executes the sort kernel, and then copies the sorted data back to the host. Um, this is not the most efficient way, but can actually have real benefits. Um, so if we look, sorting a million numbers doesn't really make sense. The overhead in copying it to and from the GPU doesn't really outweigh um, the, or yeah, the overhead and copy it to it from doesn't really help you. Um, but as you scale up to 10 million or 100 million um, integers, there can actually be a real performance uh, benefit here. So at 10 million, I think changing this code on, uh, I think I ran this on an AMD GPU I had, will increase the performance about three times, and up at 10 million, it's actually 10 times faster to copy, sort it on the device, and then copy the sorted data back to the host. Um, other operations we implement are uh, parallel reduction. So this is a common parallel operation. Basically takes a range of data and a binary operator, applies it to all of them, and returns the reduced result. So doing this in boost compute looks like this. Uh, again, we include the reduce algorithm uh, header, and we include the boost compute vector container. So unlike the previous example, we're now allocating uh, a vector to hold all of our data on the device. So this will stay resident on the device. We can fill it with data there or compute data and store it there. Um, this next line of code just creates on the host a uh, regular integer and we use this as a place to store the result. Yes? How does this compute know which device to allocate the vector on? Um, this one gets allocated in the so-called default um, context, which comes from the default device. The question was, how does Boost Compute know what device to store this data on? Uh, yeah, so it gets stored on the default device or default context. Um, there's another constructor where you can actually specify the context you want to allocate this vector. But yeah, for simplicity, just use the default one. So yeah, we, uh, all we set up this integer with our sum as the result, as where to place the result. We uh, invoke the boot, boost compute reduce algorithm, giving it the range of data and an output iterator of where to place the result. Um, and then at the end, we just print it. So how does this work? Yep. Question. Uh, kind of like accumulate, this one has a, def uh, the question was, um, where's the binary function or how does reduce know what to do? Um, Sort of like the std accumulate algorithm, there's multiple overloads. The default overload uses, by default, um, addition, and thus we get the sum out of this. Um, you just place another parameter here. If you say you want the product, you'd say multiplies here. So yeah, how does this work? Um, fundamentally, any time the user would invoke one of these algorithms or any of these higher level functions provided by Boost Compute, we must internally transform that operation into an OpenCL program object, which then gets compiled and executed on the device. So where in C++ the user calls this, internally we ge generate an OpenCL kernel which looks somewhat like this. And this kernel is responsible for distributing the work over all of the, say, cores in a GPU and um, running multiple passes, reducing the whole thing and doing it as efficiently as we can. Um, so one of the main features of the SCL is how generic it is, or how easy it is it to extend with your own um, sort of operations. In Boost Compute, it's a little more difficult because you can think of a GPU and the host as two separate computers. You can't simply pass a reference to a C++ function down into a Boost Compute kernel. Um, so in order to uh, implement this, Boost Compute provides a few higher level um, macros and functions in order to generate um, 
custom functions which can be used in OpenCL. So the first and the most simple is this boost compute function macro. It's invoked like this. Uh, you say boost compute function, and at the top here you give it essentially your function signature. So this says we're going to declare a function called plus two, which takes a single int x and returns an int. And then this last argument here is the body of the function. So this will de declare something that looks um, somewhat like a std function, but it's a boost compute function which encodes the name of it and the, the signature we expect. And this then can get passed to, in this case, the transform algorithm in order to apply this operation um, to each element in the vector. So this says, um, for each element's vector, add two to it and place it back in the same vector. Question? So what are the limitations of what you can put in the body? Yeah, yeah um, get there. Uh, the question was, what are the limitations of what goes in the body? Yeah, I'll come right back to that. So how this works essentially occurs in two phases. The first is what happens at C++ compile time. So this uh, information up here, essentially the signature of the function, um, gets encoded to a C++, a strongly typed C++ object, which then gets passed to transform and does type checking. It ensures that, say, you did transform expects a unary operation and ensures that you don't pass a function which takes two arguments or a function which takes no <coughs> arguments. And it ensures that the types that vector contains can be passed as function and convertible. Um, the second phase occurs at runtime. This uh, essentially gets stored as a string and when we invoke the transform um, algorithm, this, this user-defined code gets inserted into that program object and then executed on the device. So the drawback of this is syntax errors which occur in this body are stored as a string and they won't be detected by the C++ compiler. They get detected at runtime by the OpenCL compiler. And essentially, if you call this with something that doesn't compile here, you'll get a, uh, a runtime exception thrown, saying something along the lines of uh, program compilation failure. Now, in here, this isn't actually C++ code, but this is uh, OpenCL source code. OpenCL source code is, um, specified in a dialect of C. Basically, it's C with some extensions for vector processing, and it has things like built-in uh, vector types and geometric functions, that sort of thing. Um, did I answer your question? More? Uh, uh, since you said it's not actually C++ code, is that being passed as a string to the CL compiler or something? Or yeah. Okay. The body of the function, so the question was, is does this all get passed as a string to the OpenCL compiler? And the answer is yes. We take this information we know about the signature, we generate the signature line, and we take this body of the function, specify that as a body, and then that gets inserted um, into the transform kernel skeleton and then executed to apply some user-defined operation. Um, so that's one way of specifying custom functions. It has a, oh, another question. Uh, is it gonna get compiled every time you call it or just the first time you use it? Let's say you call transform twice the same function. Mm -hmm. Is it gonna get pulled first time only two times or and can you pre-compile it? Um, the question is, does this get compiled every time you invoke Boost Compute Transform? And the answer is no. Uh, Boost Compute implements uh, a few layers of program caching. I'll get back to that a little later though. Um, so yeah, the drawback of this is this is essentially just a string and somewhat invisible to the C++ compiler. Um, and if this fails to compile, it doesn't fail to compile at compile time, it fails to compile at runtime. Uh, a way, another way of specifying custom functions that somewhat gets around this issue is the Lambda expression framework. So this isn't, this is somewhat different than C++ 11 Lambdas and more similar to what's available in the Boost Lambda library. Um, these lambda expressions offer concise syntax for specifying these custom functions with the advantage that they're fully type checked and compiled by the C++ compiler. So the previous example, adding two to every number and vector using lambda expressions looks like this. Um, we bring in, uh, bring in a scope this lambda underscore one placeholder value and instead of defining a plus two function, we define a small lambda expression which looks like this. So it says for every number in the input, substitute it for this placeholder here, add two to it, and return it. Um, again, this works in two phases. Um, the first is 
we go through and check and make sure that the, the signature explored by this lambda function actually matches the signature expected by the transform algorithm. The second stage occurs at runtime in which we actually convert this lambda expression into OpenCL source code, which then gets inserted into the transform kernel and executed by the device. Um, another uh, different way to, well, not completely different, but a different way to specify custom functions is what I call closures, for lack of a better name. Similar to boost compute function, but also allows the ability to capture um, C++ variables that are currently in scope when the closure is defined. So they look somewhat like this. Um, instead of saying boost compute function, you say boost compute closure. Uh, you give the same signature, the return type, a name, and an and a argument list. And it takes this additional um, argument here, which is essentially a capture list, or a list of variables to capture by reference. So in this case, we're, we wanted to find a function which will tell us if the point we pass to the function is within a, cir within a circle of a given radius. So this radius uh, in C++ is defined up here. It's captured by the closure here and then made available to uh, the OpenCL kernel and can be used just like any other variable. Um, yes? How do you capture by reference and use them in an OpenCL program? What do you mean? Did I miss, miss you? So you, you told us that you capture by reference. Right. This is, this is an OpenCL program. How mm -hmm. do you use a value captured by reference in your program? Um, so the question is, how does this get captured by reference? So the reference is stored in this closure object. Um, it's, okay, so it can't, it's not exactly, when you're in OpenCL, you can't write to it and have the result reflected in the host, but you can change this number later, and the next time this closure gets um, evaluated, it'll be passed as an argument. So in C++, this object stores radius by reference, but when passed to OpenCL, it's yeah more of a value type. Um, so yeah, so we declare this closure, and we can declare a set of points, 2D points on the ho on the device, and then call in this case the count if algorithm, which will return to us the number of points which are actually found within a circle of the radius 1.5. Now if down below we change radius to say 2.5, call this count if algorithm again, we'd now get a different answer and that's the number of points within a circle of radius 2.5. Um, uh, so Boost Compute also offers a number of iterator adapters modeled after those provided in the Boost Iterator Library. Uh, these allow programmers to kind of augment or augment the functionality provided by the algorithms. So um, in many cases, this, this can lead to more performant code. So if you take the example of, say, summing up the absolute value of a large number of um, integers, a uh, trivial implementation would be to allocate some temporary array, call transform with the absolute function, store the absolute values in an array, and then call uh, std accumulate to calculate the sum of absolute values. Uh, a better way to do this is to use um, what's called a transform iterator. So on boost compute, you have your set of integers, and you would still use the accumulate, accumulate algorithm, but instead of just passing the, the raw values, you pass a transform iterator, which takes this absolute value function. So this says every time you dereference one of the values, also apply this unary function, in this case absolute value, and return that to the algorithm. So this will now, in one pass, go through and um, calculate the sum without need for any sort of temporary buffers or multiple passes over the input data. Uh, additional features. Um, so OpenGL is uh, another um, specification released by the Kronos Group, and this is for uh, gra 3D graphics programming. Um, the OpenCL implements a number of interoperability features with OpenGL, which allows you to directly render from or use uh, rendered objects in OpenCL. So Boost Compute implements a number of functions which make this a little easier. It allows you to run some computation on the GPU through OpenCL and then make those results available to the GPU for rendering. So in this case, we have a small OpenCL kernel which basically calculates the Mandelbrot, Mandelbrot fractal 
stores it to an image resident on the device, and then renders directly from the device to, um, to the screen using OpenGL. Um, program caching. So yeah, like was mentioned before, there is some overhead in OpenCL's runtime kernel compilation model. Um, program caching helps us mitigate that. So like any other caching, we, we take um, frequently used objects and store them in a cache so they can be reused without having to uh, incur this compilation penalty again. So um, how this works, say the first time you call transform with a given type and a given um, operation to apply, We'll generate a program for that, we'll compile it, and then we'll store this binary in a global cache which can be reused any other time uh, the user calls transform with the same set of um, parameters. Uh, in addition to this so runtime kernel caching, Boost Compute also implements offline kernel caching. So at the end of the program run, the, the programs stored in the cache get uh, serialized and stored to disk. And then the next time you run, these programs get reloaded from disk so that you really only have to compile an OpenCL program once per run on a system. So this nearly uh, eliminates the overhead from the uh, OpenCL compiler. Uh, another feature we implement is auto-tuning. So OpenCL runs on a wide variety of hardware with a very diverse um, set of execution characteristics. Um, the algorithms inside Boost Compute are written in a way such that there are a number of knobs which can be tuned or things that can be changed. We can change, for instance, how, how we distribute up work to be executed on the device or how much work we do serially within a thread versus how much we do horizontally across all of the threads. These parameters, um, can be changed at runtime and the effects of them can be measured. So this allows us essentially to perform a brute force search over all of this parameter space and select the optimal set of parameters to run an algorithm on a given device. So um, Boost Compute also implements or provides a number of benchmark applications and a number of tuning applications which can be used to essentially automate this for users. So a small example of this looks like, um, looks like this. The Boost Compute in includes this perf sort um, application, which measures the performance of the sort algorithm. So in this case, we'll s we tell it to sort 10 million items on the GPU and measure essentially how long it takes. So in this case, 43 milliseconds. Um, next time we run it, we run the same thing, but add this tune parameter, which tells Boost Compute to go run the auto-tuning infrastructure um, create a, a, a set of parameters to try out, go through each of them, figures out which one was the fastest, and then uses those parameters to run the sort algorithm. So with running this, we now get down to a runtime of 36 milliseconds. So essentially a 20% speed up just by having Boost Compute change some parameters that it specifies the algorithm. The bonus of this is these parameters then get stored to disk and recalled any other time we call the sort algorithm. So if we were to run the same exact top line again, we now see in we, uh, the same time, about 36 milliseconds. And this will occur any time the, the user runs the sort algorithm. Uh, I was wondering where, this, where the performance tuning data is stored. Is it something that you save to the local file system after running the tune? Or yeah. Okay. yeah. I didn't know if maybe it was something that lived in the GPU after that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. The, the question was, so after we run the tuning, these parameters get stored. Where do they get stored? And the answer is they get stored on disk and then recalled from the local file system. Um, recent news. So uh, Boost Compute went through the Boost uh, peer review in December 2014 and was accepted as an official Boost library in 2015 and hopefully should be a part of the Boost release sometime later this year, 159, I think. Um, that thank you. Here's this links to source and documentation. Let's take any questions. Can you say something about debugging these um, programs or how you would um, debug like if they fail to compile or produce the wrong results? Produce the wrong re results. <coughs> <coughs> somehow get intermediate results back. Uh, yeah. So the question was um, how do how would a user go about debugging? Um, 
their kernels if they got the wrong results. I guess the kind of debugger support isn't uh, as advanced for GPUs as it is for CPUs. Um, yeah, a lot of times it just comes down to breaking your algorithm into multiple components, running through each one, verifying and getting the correct results at each uh, point in time, and kind of working through it that way. Another advantage of OpenGL or OpenCL is that it also runs on CPU targets. So really, you can debug something that's destined to run on GPU on the CPU for some. Um, for some sets of tasks, and then use the host side debugger to actually step through kernel code. Any other questions? So, I don't know how feasible that is, but could you modify the boost compute function macro to write that the, the, the function body out as a C++ function as well with some uh, compatibility types and functions maybe so that it get, does get type checked? Not for executing, just for type checking. Yeah, um, I've thought about doing that. It becomes difficult in that the the source code specified there is not always C++. Sorry. The question was, in the boost compute function macro, could we also um, compile the body of the function in order to check that it's actually um, correct? And yeah, the difficulty comes in that C++ and the OpenCL C uh, language are different and don't completely intersect. Um, there's types and functions available in OpenCL which aren't available in, um, in C++, which makes it difficult. <laughs> Though I, yeah, well, like those. I would think the problem would be if, if not so much thing, types and functions being present because you can always add stubs for those yourself. The problem would be syntactic elements that don't map into C++ if there are anything <coughs> like that. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good idea. Um, the comment was there's more than just not having functions types available, but that syntactic elements of OpenCLC don't exactly match those in C++. It, so I don't know yeah. the case they're actually really close. I mean, they're both based on C at some point. Um, so you mentioned the global function cache. Is it possible to store that on disk and then start to, from a warm cache and subsequent one? Yeah, so that's what the offline kernel caching does. It does require a uh, you specify and uh, define basically to enable it and also link against the boost file system library. But yeah. So the question was, um, can you basically take the online kernel cache, save it to desk, and then restore it so you always have a warm cache? Uh, I just thought about um, also using or uh, having range generators, not only that it saves typing, but also it runs some errors. Yeah, that'd be nice. Uh, the question was, have I considered uh, using range iterators or range-like algorithm? And yeah, um, for now, I want to focus on basically mimicking what's present in the STL. I know there's a lot of work around ranges and multiple different like approaches to it, which until that shakes out. But yeah, it's on a direction that I'd like to go in the future. Question. I have a question about just take for example the implementation of the sort mm -hmm. uh, function, and uh, when you when you render that. OpenCL, do you how do you take advantage of the multiple compute engines which are available to to paralyze that operation at that level? So the question was, when I create the sort code, how do I take advantage of the architecture of the GPU or the multiple cores available? Um, so yeah, internally, it the sort algorithm is it's not just like quick sort like you'd see in the STL. It's uh, for some cases, you get a radix sort. In other cases, uh, you get different types of sort to, based on the device. And internally, the algorithm takes care of distributing the work in uh, in an efficient or optimal way, and then executing it. Well, actually, I think what my, my broader question is: some of the algorithms in STL don't seem to me inherently paralyzable. And did, were you managed, did you manage to? Uh, exploit all the processes and all those algorithms, or, or what was the actual kind of short version of the experience with that? Uh, the question is, many of the STL algorithms are serial in nature and may not always lend themselves to efficient parallel solutions. Um, and that's true, but um, yeah, I think currently all of the algorithms that we implement have parallel implementations. Now, how efficient they are is somewhat relative. Some things really don't lend themselves to parallel computation. But um, 
things like sorting or parallel reductions or just like a raw transform it maps really well to parallel architectures. So, so you would have to say that on some of them you're going to get a really good result and other ones you might be disappointed. Is that, is that That's true. Yeah, you'd have to benchmark. So the question is some of the algorithms may be efficient on a GPU and others may not. And that's true and you'd have to benchmark and figure out if it works well enough for your application. Question. Uh, if you want to make use of this library in an existing project, mm -hmm. uh, what are certain guidelines you would, what are the things that you would target? Would you target like the sort and that kind of stuff? Or what are some of the guidelines you go with? Um, the, the question was if someone wanted to use this in a library today, what are the sort of guidelines I give? Um, yeah, the algorithms really um, differ, and a big impact to that comes to what device you actually execute them on. So it really comes down to you know, running your operation on a particular device and measuring how fast it is. Um, yeah, the auto-tuning infrastructure can help to kind of adapt to different devices, but um, yeah, it really comes down to how powerful the device you're using it is. Is there an API then for managing the GPU buffers so that you don't have to constantly <coughs> yeah. the, your data to the GPU for every operation? Yeah, so the question is, is are there APIs for managing GPU buffers? So yeah, internally, like, any of the boost compute container types are all types that are always resident on the device. So boost compute vector always allocates a buffer that lives on the device. And you can explicitly call copy to move that back and forth. And same with the other containers, like the bit sets or maps and stuff. Um, there's some further APIs that for particular GPUs allow you to map sections of uh, host memory to be accessible by the device. And boost compute also provides um, mechanisms for using those. Um, calls, uh, the question is, are all the calls blocking or um, do you have to wait until they complete? And the answer is, for calls which always execute entirely on device, um, they will be asynchronous and you can use the queue to basically block for uh, them to finish. For, for algorithms which um, like reduce, which uh, calculate a number and then copy it back to the host, that will be synchronous because we always block on the copy back to the host. Um, question? I was just wondering if you had a chance to test it out on some of the more esoteric uh, OpenCL targets like uh, Corner or AOCL. No, not currently. Uh, the question was, have I had a chance to try it out on more esoteric targets? Um, not currently. Though, if they, they should work. Um, if anyone wants to test and let me know, that would be Amazing. So I was curious if you had any um, functionality for doing like linear alpha or matrix operations or if you had any plans for that. Um, not presently. Uh, really, I've uh, the question was um, is there, uh, does Boost Compute implement any functionality for, say, matrix multiplication or any other um, sort of linear algebra task? And the answer is not currently. Um, I've really aimed to try and implement the STL. And that API, but other APIs like I don't know, Blosser, LUPOC, or um, FFTs could be built using a lot of the same underlying infrastructure. Um. Is it possible to get a future back for the things that you want to execute asynchronously? It is um, in some parts of the API. Currently, um, the only one that really implements that is the copy async method, which then returns, allows you to copy between the host and the device or the device and the host in an asynchronous, fa asynchronous fashion. Uh, the question is, is there a future like API that allows you to, um, to execute functions asynchronously and then wait for them? And yeah. Couldn't you do that just by sort of making a wrapper that would apply any to, your, to, to any of your, your constructs here? Uh, can you repeat that one more time? Uh, I, I'm, that's an interesting question. And I'm wondering if, if we, one could make a wrapper that would, which would provide a future in, in the internals of which would be a, a series of, of the calls that you have. So the question was... Isn't that orthogonal to the, to the library itself is rather than having it built in? Right. So the question was, can I uh, provide a wrapper around everything which uh, implements this asynchronous or future-like behavior? Um, 
Sure, but really I've targeted implementing and mimicking the SCL API. Some of the, there are extensions which return this boost compute future object, which allow you to, you know, queue up and wait for and block on um, asynchronous uh, computation. Any other questions? All right, thank you.